alayhi wa sallam. My beloved brothers and sisters, beginning today praising Allah and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for providing us with guidance and mercy and so many blessings we cannot count. But also, alhamdulillah, not just to have the theory of Islam, but to have been blessed with the Khatim al-Anbiya, the seal of all of the prophets, guides and messengers, through Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so that we can see how to engage and live the life that Allah has for us. You know, today I want to share with you, um, I think what they call it sometimes, tough love. Tough love. And as a person, alhamdulillah, who I came to Islam, as an adult. And so I had to learn about Islam and sort of correct the way I used to think in order for me to be able, alhamdulillah, to get closer to Allah. So today, I want to give you this sort of sense of of two poles, two, there are two opposites. There's good news, uh, there is a, a, a bushra, a good news, right? And there's nadira, uh, some warning. And this was how the, the Quran has this language going back and forth. Inna ladina amanu, ladina kafiru. Goes back and forth between people who are accepting and people who are rejecting. That the reward for those who believe will be Jannah. Those who reject will be hellfire. It's, it's always this back and forth in the Quran. So today I'm going to be a little back and forth. And some of it, I'm afraid I'm going to try not to be too hard. But alhamdulillah that you get the, the point. The good news is for me, that we are all in the same situation. We're all in the same boat as believers. And so we have a collective responsibility to do good and to prevent evil. I remember one day I was at a janazah. And the janaza was for a very prominent Muslim. And at that gathering, someone spoke. And they said, before we make the janaza for this person, I want you to remember one thing. And that is that all of us read Surah Al-Fatiha the opening surah of the Qur'an. We all read it. They said, but remember that this prayer that you're making, sometimes you make it alone. Sometimes you make it in the jama'ah, in a group. But the words of Al-Fatiha are not for you as an individual. It is a message and a dua for the group. They said, remember when you recite Surah Al-Fatiha, you don't say, Ihdini Sirat Al-Mustaqeem. You don't say, Ihdini Sirat Al-Mustaqeem. You say, Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeem. Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeem. We're asking Allah to show us, to provide us, 
to guide us to the straight path. Now, you know, there are many traditions and faiths. Often their common worship is they're praying for themselves. But in Al-Fatiha, always, 17 times a day, you are saying, Oh Allah, show us, guide us to this way, this sirat. That's the good news. And maybe this is not such, maybe not so bad news. I don't know. But we are living in a very, very critical time. Maybe, maybe for us as Muslims, maybe now, maybe not even Muslims, maybe, maybe America, maybe the whole world is in a very difficult time. And we need some assurances. In the 13th surah of the Quran, Allah reminds us in the translation of its meaning, for each one, talking about individuals, there are successive malaika before them and behind them and on the sides of them to protect them by the decree of Allah. This surah, Allah is saying in the 11th ayah that for the people who believe in Allah, who are connected to Allah, that Allah has placed a shield around them, a protection. I didn't use the English word, they often translate the word malaika as angel. But since people in America have an idea, you say angel, they have a certain idea, I want to say malaika. These creatures created by Allah that obey Allah only, and they never disobey God. They do whatever Allah asks them to do of righteousness, and they have different jobs, and the Quran is telling us that around us, there are malaika protecting us. And then the ayah continues in the translation of his meaning saying, Indeed, Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. Let me stop for a moment. I spent many years studying with Sheikh Muhammad al Hanuti, Rahim al Ali, and I miss him so much. And I ask Allah to have mercy on him and give him the reward of Jannah ma Abrar. The condition that this ayah is talking about, because sometimes many people, they flip the meaning of the, the ayah upside down. They say, oh, Allah won't change the low condition of a people. People are low until they, they get on the right track and then Allah will change their condition and raise them up. Well, you see, in this ayah, the reference is actually the other way around. That you and I, as people who are connected to Allah, Allah will never bring us down, except that we change. In Christianity, they like to say that everyone is born in sin, and then they have to find salvation. The paradigm in Islam is the opposite. Everyone is born in the fitrah, purity, no sin. 
It is their condition that brings them down. Their parents who don't guide them properly. Their environment that is calling them to things other than the remembrance of Allah. But everyone starts out at this level and then when they change, they go to the low level and then Allah informs us. So when Allah intends for a people ill, there is no one who can repel it. And there is none but Allah that can protect you. So the issue is if you move away from the methodology of Allah, you bring yourself low, that no one can protect you. Today, alhamdulillah, I want to talk about racism, revenge, and radicalization. Now, to do that, I want to perhaps give you a framework because I believe that many of us, our relationship with the narrative of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, has to be brought into the 14th century. We're in the year 1437. But I think there are some Muslims there still in the first century or the second century because we haven't brought forward the message of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ into today's world. Let me give you an example. And I think it's, it's telling because of where we live right now. We know that in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, who the Quran describes that he is the best example of human character, behavior, the best. So we know that, alhamdulillah, but I want to take you back in a, in a time travel to the sixth year after Hijrah. The Muslims have been persecuted, isolated, but they found a home in a place that's a multi-faith place. There are Jews there, there are Sabians, uh, Yemeni Christians come to visit. The Prophet ﷺ is teaching openly about Islam. But in this year, the companions go with Muhammad ﷺ and they want to perform Umrah. And they reach a place And they are met by emissaries from the Quraysh who say, no further. Almost like Donald Trump saying to the Mexicans, we're going to build a wall, not, you can't come in. Or no Muslims are allowed in America because we have some concerns about you, you can't come in. Well now the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu they're coming just to make Umrah. They're not coming for war. They're not coming for revenge. They're not retaliating because they've been discriminated against. All they want to do is come, pray, and leave. This is the history. They're wearing the garments of Ikhram. So there's no doubt Anyone who sees them looks at us and they can tell, we're just here like everybody else. But the Quran said, no, we don't want you to come. And they didn't want Rasulullah and his companions to come because they didn't want their success to encourage others in Mecca to embrace Islam. Because they know, what, they know what it means. That if this idea of brotherhood and sisterhood, the end of racism and discrimination against the end of slavery, the discrimination of women, is not going to be good for their business. 
especially there in the business of idolatry, it's going to be bad for business in Mecca. But finally, alhamdulillah, they engage in negotiations, not in confrontation. And there is one, Urwa bin Mas'ud, who becomes the final negotiator with the Prophet salam. What are we going to do? Do we let Muslims in or not? But what's interesting for me in this narrative is that Urwa is also studying the people around the Prophet Because at first blush, people would say in a society where there are a lot of different cultures, that they're going to lack unity. They're going to fall into tribalism and racism. As soon as any conflict hits them, they're all going to run to their corner and they're going to abandon their, their mission. And so this becomes the first intelligence. Wow, look at all the diversity here. How can they have unity with this much diversity? If you look in America now, most churches, most synagogues, most temples, whoever goes to that place, they look like the other people who go to that place. The most integrated place in America for prayer is right here, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I wish, alhamdulillah, we had more time, but we, we'll probably finish this another time. But Urwa saw the kind of diversity that we have today in the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu and after taking some time in evaluating, they send a message and they said, you know, we don't have to worry about the Muslims. They're so divided culturally and ethnically and all of that. The soon, soon as the pressure hits them, they're going to break apart. Uruwa sent the message back. He said, I have bad news for you. He said, I've been the emissary and the ambassador to the Emperor of Persia, the Emperor of Rome, and the Nagashi of Ethiopia, Habisha. He said, never did I find any people with more love and devotion for their leader than I find among the Muslims for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa That unity and diversity, alhamdulillah, at this sentinel time, for the Ummah of the Prophet was critical. Walhamdulillah, that day they signed a treaty for 10 years of peace. The Muslims felt that they lost at first because they accepted not to be accepted. They accepted that they're going to turn back. They're not going to make Umrah. They're not going to be accepted, but there's a treaty between Muhammad وسلم, and the Quraysh which raised them to the level of political power. Right now, alhamdulillah, we are in the age of developing our own political power. And alhamdulillah, I believe that the most critical turning point for the mission of Muhammad alayhi salam and Islam was the day of Hudaybiyah when they signed that treaty. It was more important than Badr, Uhud, Khandaq, Khaybar, even Fatimakkah, the ability, alhamdulillah, 
to establish ourselves as a force equal to the others with the protection and the security of Allah. Those companions, they stayed together against racism and they did not seek revenge and Allah gave them victory. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد right now we are facing every day especially in the media Islamophobic attacks that's what they call it Islamophobic But here's the, here's the bad news. And maybe it might be easier for you to take it if I talk about somebody else. I'm a black American. I grew up in the ghetto. I did. I grew up in a neighborhood that probably, if we thought about that neighborhood, I, I was listening to a, an author uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, he said, I grew up in Baltimore, and as a child when I was growing up in Baltimore, every day that I left my house, I was afraid that somebody might kill me, rob me, or stab me. And when I first listened to him, I said, he's exaggerating. It's not that bad. I grew up in a neighborhood like that. I said, wow, you know what? I grew up every day in the neighborhood I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, being conscious that somebody might kill me today. We used to decide what clothes to wear. If you're going to a certain place, you can't wear certain clothes because people will rob you and take your clothes. This is New York City. But we never, I never thought about it, that I was living in fear every day because I thought it was normal. I thought everybody lived like that. In Baltimore last year, they had over 300 homicides. 300 people were killed by somebody else, probably 95% of it black on black. So what are you saying, Imam Johari? I'm not saying don't go to Baltimore, not the thing. I'm saying the stereotype would be that blacks are violent. And I would reject that idea of how violent it is. But the 300 people who lost their loved one, they can attest to the fact that it's violent. The people who were killed in San Bernardino by the Muslim family, Muslim family they claim to be Muslim, right? You can't tell the people in San Bernardino that they, that they have an irrational fear of Muslims and Islam. Their fear is rational. Somebody in their neighborhood who claimed that they were killing their neighbors because of Islam, the woman posted something on Facebook, I believe it. Something's going on. And we have to change our condition. We have young Muslims who feel, especially young men, who feel alienated, isolated. Then they go on the internet and somebody tells them that the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, is to take revenge. That's what they tell them. Not only do they say that, it's, that they take revenge, that you can kill people who are not combatants. Now you and I cannot continue to walk around 
and ignore the fact that there are people who are on the internet luring our children to become radicals. We can't. You have to face it. Just like I have to face the fact that 300, there are 300 killers who live in Baltimore, most of them not going to be arrested, who are terrorizing those neighborhoods. Now, I actually work around the issues of gun violence, even though I'm a former NRA member, that's National Rifle Association, I want you to get the wrong idea. But something has to be done. We have taught our children how great the Battle of Badr and Uhud, Khandaq, Khaybar, Fatimaka. And when they get on the internet, that means you should take revenge against the Kufar. Most of our neighbors, I can tell you right now, they're not Kufar. Most of them are trying to be decent human beings to find out what God wants them to do. And they're doing it through Christianity or Judaism or whatever. If you want to be in the example of Rasulullah you need to reach out to them. And internally, we need to have a dialogue to end our own racism. You see, when you refer to your neighbor and you say, oh, by the way, I have, I have this American neighbor. Now, most of your neighbors who live in America, they're Americans. That's not what you mean. I've heard people in this masjid say, my American neighbor did so and so. What they really mean is, my neighbor is a kafir. That's what they mean. My kafir neighbor, but they don't want to say kafir, so they say American. And I'm like, wow, before I accepted Islam, I used to be your kafir neighbor. Right? That's, that doesn't sound nice, does it? I was your kafir neighbor. Shaykh al-Hanuti, rahimahullah, he said, you know what? A person is a kafir who knows the truth and rejects it. Which means probably the largest population of kafirun are people who pray with us. Who know what Allah is, they know what the Prophet is, they know what the guidance of the Quran is, and they decide openly to do something different. Your uninformed neighbor could be the next Muslim if you would reach out to him. And when you teach your children that your neighbor is a kafir, you're setting them up to go on the internet when you're not home for somebody to finish the sentence for them. Then why don't you take revenge? Brothers and sisters in Islam, we have a lot of work to do. And the biggest work is inside. I don't care that less than 1% of all of the people who have been, been involved in mass shootings a Muslim, that's not my point. My point is 1% is too many. And allowing people to use the deen of Islam to justify un-Islamic acts means that we have to do our job. I know you feel uncomfortable. It's okay. I'm going to take a risk right now. I had a friend. We made hajj together. He was imprisoned. He was a really good brother before he went to prison. When he came out of prison, he said that they, he was tortured in prison. And so now he's ready to go and take revenge against the people who, who put him in prison. His name is Anwar al Awlaki. He was my friend was radicalized. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our children. Allahumma deena fi man hadayt, wa afina fi man afayt, wa tuwalena fi man tawalayt. O Allah, guide us among those whom you have guided. O Allah, take us as a friend among those whom you have taken as a friend. Ya Allah, have mercy on us, walhamdulillah, as we strive to live the deen of Islam. 
O Allah, grant us, walhamdulillah, your sirat al-mustaqeem. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. O Allah, we ask your mercy on those who are suffering, Ya Allah, around the corner and around the world. O Allah, join our hearts together, Ya Allah, in love for you and love for each other. Ya Allah, help us, walhamdulillah, that we seek the moral high ground, walhamdulillah, and that we share the love and the mercy, walhamdulillah, of Allah and His Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O Allah, we ask that you grant us rizq al Ya Allah. O Allah, make us successful, walhamdulillah, in this life and in the hereafter. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasnatan wa fi al-akhirati hasnatan wa qina dha bin nar khinna jannat ma abrar. يا عزيز يا غفار يا رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أقيم صلاته